This video is sponsored by Audible. Audible is your one-stop shop for spoken word entertainment with an endless selection of audiobooks, original celebrity content, meditations, and more. I use Audible when out for a walk, doing kitchen prep, cleaning, you name it. It's an amazing resource for maintaining my personal wellness, allowing me to both keep active and hands-free while I keep my mind engaged, and avoiding the same song playing over and over again on loop in there. What I enjoy most about Audible is how little I have to worry about it. I get a credit each month to use on whatever premium title I like, and if I can't decide on anything, the credits roll over and are still there once I'm ready to catch up. If all my credits are gone and after that I still want something more, then I can just pick something out of the thousands of titles on Audible's Plus catalog, no credits required. They've got a bunch more to explore, like their exclusive Words Plus music series or maybe even a podcast you've never considered before. Once you've got yourself a title, no need to worry because it's yours to keep forever, and if you're not satisfied with it, then just take advantage of the audiobook exchange feature, no questions asked. I just started listening to Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow, and I'd highly recommend it if you're interested in knowing what it took to expose Harvey Weinstein. To get this title at no cost to you, head on over to audible.com slash rainbot or text rainbot to 500-500 for a free 30-day Audible trial. Again, that's audible.com slash rainbot or just text rainbot to 500-500. It goes without saying that kids aren't always the easiest to handle, but what happens when a child's mental health takes a nosedive and nothing seems to be helping? When few options remain, it's not unheard of for guardians to turn to alternative forms of therapy. At best, their results vary, but are relatively harmless. As we'll soon see, however, at their worst, the choice to put your child in the hands of an unlicensed practitioner can prove to be fatal. Tonight we'll be discussing Candace Newmaker, a young girl who was failed by virtually every adult around her. But before we discuss how her life came to an end, we must first understand how she ended up in the situation to begin with. Born in North Carolina to a teenage mother and a violent father, the deck was stacked against young Candace Tiara Elmore from the very start. The information we could find about her earliest years paints a picture of instability, with she and her sisters living in various trailers and dilapidated homes throughout the state. Candace was only three years old when she and the other children in her household were removed from their parents' care by social services. In spite of this intervention, however, things seemingly remained chaotic. Candace was shuffled from one care to the next. She'd lived in six different foster homes in just two short years before finally being adopted at the age of five. Her adoptive mother was one Jean Newmaker, a pediatric nurse. While we might expect her work with children to have her ready for the parenting challenges she was about to face, Jean herself would later admit that she was not at all equipped for the difficulties Candace would bring into her life. It would quickly become clear to Mrs. Newmaker that her child appeared to present severe psychological issues. She launched into extended fits of rage, had killed her pet goldfish on one occasion, started a fire in the home on another, and perhaps most troublingly, had once sexually assaulted two children. Jean would go on to describe her daughter as, quote, extremely defensive at home, which will make more sense in just a moment. When Candace was seven, Mrs. Newmaker began to further her efforts to address what was going on. These included the use of several drugs and traditional therapy, though unfortunately the sessions, quote, often ended with her biting or spitting at the therapist, according to ABC. While this might seem paradoxical given the behavior that we've heard about so far, the girls' school teachers didn't seem to feel she was badly behaved at all. What this might indicate is that her issues were closely tied to figures she viewed as parental, and this was exactly the line of thought that her adoptive mother would run with. Mrs. Newmaker was convinced that her daughter was suffering from a condition known as Reactive Attachment Disorder, or RAD for short. It's described by the Mayo Clinic as, quote, a rare but serious condition in which an infant or young child does not establish healthy attachments with parents or caregivers. Reactive attachment disorder may develop if the child's basic needs for comfort, affection, and nurturing aren't met, and loving, caring, stable attachments with others are not established. Furthermore, signs and symptoms of RAD may include unexplained withdrawal, fear, sadness, or irritability, a sad or listless appearance, not seeking comfort or showing no response when comfort is given, not expressing emotions of conscience like remorse or regret, and having tantrums or being more irritable than their age or current circumstance might account for. 
Again, RAD presents challenges bonding with caregivers, usually as a result of neglect and or abuse, and seems to appear more frequently in children who have faced instability, be it spending time in foster care or having been taken away from their primary caregivers after forming a bond with them. Whether or not Candace truly had RAD is unclear, as the condition sometimes is believed to have been overdiagnosed, and there is also the issue of just how complex these sorts of things are. One condition may be mistaken for another due to overlapping symptoms for example, but nonetheless, RAD is real and Candace was being treated for it. Again, Mrs. Newmaker did supposedly exhaust all traditional means as far as therapy and medications were concerned. Nothing seemed to really be fixing the issue, and that's when the desperate mother happened upon something called reattachment therapy, sometimes also known as rebirthing. As the title implies, its intention was supposedly to forge or reforge a parent-child bond between the patient and their caregiver. From what we could find, however, much of this therapy seemed to boil down to fully grown adults, pinning children down and chastising them. Needless to say, reattachment therapy is considered pseudoscience and is highly controversial. Still, desperate parents trying to do what they can for their children have ended up paying money for them to undergo such therapy, and this same desperation is what led Candace and her mother to Evergreen, Colorado in April of 2000. Candace was to undergo a two-week reattachment therapy course, the first week of which apparently went off without a hitch and seemed to maybe even be helping the now 10-year-old girl. Week two was where things would go terribly wrong. As part of the second week, Candace would undergo a rebirthing session. The idea is that the child will be lightly confined through some means, in this case a blanket and some cushions, and be forced to struggle against this restraint, against their parents, their therapists, or both, for an extended period of time. If the child becomes becomes angry or aggressive, the therapists are to tighten their grip. Allegedly, the aim here is to show the child that they can be controlled and also feel safe while under that control. Eventually, after being pinned down and yelled at for whatever arbitrary amount of time the practitioner feels is necessary, the patient is supposed to force their way free in a simulated rebirth. Some, of course, believe that this would result in the creation of that aforementioned missing child-parent bond. On April 18th, Candace's rebirthing would be carried out with no less than five adults present. The first was Connell Watkins, an unlicensed therapist. The session itself would take place in the basement of her home. The second was Julie Ponder, another unlicensed therapist. Next, there was Brita St. Clair, an office manager who, as far as we can tell, was not pretending to be a therapist, and her boyfriend, Jack McDaniel, an intern. Finally, there, of course, was Mrs. Newmaker. The session was videotaped, and this tape would later be shown in court. The transcript tells a disturbing story. Candace is instructed to assume the fetal position, where she's wrapped in a sheet and covered in a number of pillows. Four of the attending adults then begin to press on the child, and that's when Julie Ponder begins asking questions. So imagine yourself as a teeny little baby inside your mother's womb and what it felt like. Warm. It felt tight because her stomach was all around you. What do you think you thought about when you were in there? Candace tells Ponder that she thought she was going to die in there, and that's when Mrs. Newmaker chimes in, talking about how she's expecting and excited, hoping for a little girl she can love and keep safe. Watkins steps in and tells Candace that if the baby doesn't decide to be born, then it dies, and that it's actually a wonderful thing when a baby chooses to be born. Candace is then asked if she's ready to be reborn, and this is where things take a very dark turn. Ponder explains that the baby has to come out head first, how the girl has to push really hard with her feet in order to escape, and how both she and her mother will die if she doesn't do this. She frantically asks who's sitting on her as tears begin streaming down her face. She begs them to stop pushing on her and reiterates several times that she cannot breathe. At one point, she flat out tells them that she is going to die. Do you want to die? Ponder asks, to which Candace replies, No, but I'm going to. Please, I can't breathe. I can't do it anymore. Please quit pushing on me. The child then begs for help, at which point Watkins and Mrs. Newmaker launch into roleplay, with the mother saying she's feeling the contractions associated with labor. Candace tells the adults that she's going to die several more times and says, quote, Can you let me have some oxygen? You mean like you want me to die for real? To which Ponder replies, Uh-huh. Go ahead and die right now. For real. Soon after, Watkins tells Candace to, quote, just go ahead and die. It's easier. It takes a lot of courage to be born. When the child mentions again that she was promised oxygen, Watkins adds, 
quote, you gotta fight for it. Around 20 minutes into the traumatic ordeal, Candace vomits and says that she needs to use the bathroom. When she inevitably defecates in her pants, the therapists tell her to, quote, go ahead and to, quote, stay in there with the poop and vomit. When Candace later states that it's hot and reiterates again that she cannot breathe, Ponder tells her to scream. Candace, in response, simply says, no. Over 30 minutes in, Ponder is asking for more pressure on the child, and intern Jack McDaniel, who will remind you is a fully grown man, is leaning on a pillow on the girl's head. Quote, getting pretty tight in there, Watkins says, to which Ponder responds, quote, yep, less and less air all the time. She gets to be stuck in there with her own puke and poop. At the 40 minute mark, Watkins calls Candace a quitter, and that's when the girl spoke her final word, no. The adults continue to berate an unresponsive Candace before taking a break, during which the therapists chat about their dream homes while a child lies dead in the room. This goes on until more than an hour after the session began. Watkins says, let's talk to the twerp. When Candace is unwrapped, she adds, quote, oh, there she is sleeping in her vomit. The combined weight of the adults leaning on Candace was over 600 pounds, though they would claim that they weren't all applying pressure at the same time, as though that makes any difference. The Guardian reported that Candace appeared blue when the blankets were removed. It was soon determined that the girl was likely dead due to asphyxiation a full 20 minutes before being uncovered. Upon seeing her body, Mrs. Newmaker screamed and Connell Watkins attempted CPR. 911 was called and paramedics were on the scene in around 10 minutes. While they managed to restore the child's pulse, she was later declared brain dead and passed away at the hospital the next day. There's little to be said about the immediate aftermath, though during the inevitable legal proceedings, Watkins, the child abusing fraud, would act as though she wasn't just responsible for killing a child. Quote, Candace's death is a tragedy and so is her life. I think of her story as being an American tragedy because there are thousands of children in this country today who have suffered trauma during their first two years of life. They will be misdiagnosed and mistreated and ineffectively treated for years. Many of them, if they're lucky, will be adopted by loving parents, much like Jean Newmaker, and they will devote their resources and all their energy to help heal their children from emotional and behavioral problems that they didn't create. And when they fail, they will be blamed. This is a quote from Watkins, having completely failed to understand that Mrs. Newmaker was not the problem. Rather, the problem was that a child needlessly died in Watkins' own basement because she and her unqualified friends had no clue what they were doing and charged a struggling parent thousands of dollars to do it anyway. On April 20th, 2001, both unlicensed therapists were found guilty of reckless child abuse resulting in death. They were each given the maximum sentence for their charge, 16 years in prison. The assistants and the adoptive mother were tried later that same year, with Sinclair and McDaniel receiving 10 years of probation for criminally negligent child abuse and being sentenced to serve 1,000 hours community service as a part of a plea bargain. Jean Newmaker pled guilty to neglect and abuse and was given a four-year suspended sentence, after which the charges were cleared from her record. In 2006, during an ABC interview, Connell Watkins would solidify her position as the main villain in this piece by continuing to shirk all responsibility. Quote, there was no weight on her. She can sit up. She can stand up. We're just sitting on the ground. She could push us away easily. She would even blame Candace, the victim in all this, on several occasions, claiming that the 10-year-old girl would have escaped the four adults who suffocated her if she'd really wanted to. As a result of this tragedy, Candace's law was passed, outlawing rebirthing as a treatment in the state of Colorado. Other states have since passed comparable legislation in an attempt to prevent such an incident from happening again. Candace Newmaker's story is a testament to the dangers of putting our health, our lives, and especially the lives of our children into the hands of those doing nothing more than peddling snake oil.